Chapter 13. The Destroyer. Part 2. One shudders to imagine what inhuman thoughts lie behind that mask. What dreams of chronic and sustained cruelty. Spy, Team Fortress 2. Port of Tokyo Warehouse District. Rumi's mind was in a frenzy as she quickly evacuated the firefighters from the port. Her ears were still ringing from the massive explosion earlier and the panicking emergency personnel wasn't helping her at all. Looking behind her, she saw soldiers and heroes staring toward Eye Island completely gobsmacked and it wasn't hard to see why. They just witnessed the chainsaw-wielding maniac sawing a man straight down the middle and hacked two more to pieces before throwing one of them and the camera out of the observation deck window. From there, they watched him butcher the steel sabers without mercy with weaponry that should be, by all accounts, outlawed. Then he started to tear them apart with his bare hands and ripped off the head of a mercenary through his stomach before throwing it at the camera and cutting off the transmission, leaving everyone who was watching the transmission horrified and some of them throwing up. And then came the explosion. Miruko remembered being thrown back and nearly having her eardrums blown out as shattered glass from the warehouse rained down on her and the others. As they gathered their thoughts together, they heard the sounds of battle coming from my island. It was loud enough for all to hear but Rumi's heightened hearing began to pick up other sounds amongst the gunfire and explosions, screaming. It soon began to dawn upon everyone that the vigilante was waging war upon the sabers and winning. As everyone listened to the chaotic noises coming from the artificial island, Miruko was slowly beginning to realize that this was on her. Maybe Endeavor was right to yell at her for not bringing the vigilante in the first time they met at the park. Maybe this was all her fault. And yet why did she feel so elated that the vigilante was killing the sabers? Miruko's smile vanished and her mood was replaced with shame when she realized she was going back to that dark place again. Even after all those years of leaving that part of her past behind, it still came rushing back to her, with a vengeance. Unknown Location Leaning back in his chair with the side of his face resting against his bald hand, the dreaded leader of the League of Villains watched the news. This was certainly an unexpected outcome. Not once did he predict that the events at Eye Island would escalate to such a level. The destruction, the bloodshed, the panic that was brought about from the transmission and the explosion, all of it caused by a vigilante. The same man who tore off his student's arm. All for one had a particular disdain for those who participated in vigilantism. Since they weren't constrained by the law, they could freely do whatever they wanted and engage villains without any consequence. The problem was that sometimes they would unknowingly interfere in his machinations and made sure to have his agents eliminate them if necessary. But then there was this man. Dispatching several pro-heroes non-lethally and engaging an entire organization of infamous contract killers was unheard of. The vigilante paid no mind to the sheer panic he was causing when he slaughtered the steel sabers on national television or the sheer devastation he unleashed when he set off that explosion, possibly from when he destroyed the sabers submarine. Something about this man intrigued all for one. He didn't need to capture him or even speak to him to know. He could see that this vigilante was special and whatever quirk he had, all for one desired it. This was one of those very rare occurrences where he was willing to persuade a vigilante to join the LOV. He made himself a mental note to look into a particular former pro hero turned vigilante over in Kobe. But that could be saved for later, he had to focus on the matter at hand. An outside element had appended his plans on Eye Island and he needed to retake control. Luckily, All For One always had a backup plan in case things ever went sour. He picked up the cell phone from his desk and was about to contact one of his followers when he noticed that he had just received a text from Kurogiri. I have successfully retrieved Tamura's arm. The police were currently too preoccupied with the Eye Island siege to notice. Excellent. With any luck, Dr. Garaki would be able to reattach his protege's arm. All for one scrolled through his contacts until he found the one he wanted. He pressed the call button. Yes, Master. Are you anywhere near Eye Island? I am, Master. Good. I'm sending you some of our members to accompany you to the island with a special package. Wolfram and the Sabres had their chance, execute Plan B. Eye Island Expo District. Two sabers from Gamma Squad couldn't take their eyes off the rising pillars of smoke coming from the central quadrant of Eye Island. Behind them were scores of sabers setting up defenses and mobilizing their APCs in response to the explosion and the sounds of a massive battle. 
The two could sense the dread and uncertainty in the air as some mercenaries began to bring out the big guns for their emplacements. This is bad, man. This is so fucking bad. You're telling me. How the hell did one man get past us? Your guess is as good as mine. Did you see what he did to our guys on TV? That was some fucked up shit, Marley. Marley checked over the ammo belt attached to his MG4 light machine gun. There's no way that guy could have been a hero. They don't kill. Ever. You don't think they have people like that hidden from the public eye, do you? Cruz swallowed. Don't be fucking stupid, Cruz. There's no way the Hero Association would hire anybody like that. It doesn't fit their M.O. at all. Marley scoffed. But what if he's a part of some secret Hero Black Ops program that we don't know about? I think we should just surrender. I mean, maybe that psycho will let us lead Dash. Marley smacked Cruz across the face. Surrender. How someone like you got to wear this uniform, I'll never know. Sabres never surrender. Do you really think the Hero Association will show us any leniency after the shit we've done over the years? We have the blood of 246 heroes all over our hands. They are never gonna let this go. Hey. Knock it off and move out. A saber shouted at Cruz and Merrily. The sergeants want all of us gathered. The two soldiers followed one of their own to a massive gathering of sabers from squads Gamma, Beta, and Alpha. All of them were armed and incredibly antsy due to the destruction of their moving headquarters as well as the losses they suffered from the blast and whatever the hell was going on over at the central quadrant. Three sergeants were standing atop an APC, regarding the crowd of mercenaries gathered before them. All right, everyone listen up. Our situation here is FUBAR. We've lost the sub, most of our forces, our radios are fried and the Tango primary is still on the island. We are effectively cut off from 9 and it won't be long before the JSDF and the heroes over on the mainland mountain attempt to retake the island. The first sergeant began. The Tango primary has reduced our ground forces to 35% operational status so here's what we are going to do, we will mount our defenses around the perimeter of the expo district and hold our positions until 9 can send for reinforcements and possible exfiltration. A second sergeant briefed. We want everyone to keep their eyes peeled and have a second pair in the back of your heads. Get to your posts and make sure all of our emplacements are locked and loaded. If any of you see the first sign of the Tango primary or a hero SHIT. The third sergeant gawked when he witnessed a fuel tanker carrying two tanks filled with petroleum soar through the air right towards them. Everyone looked up and scrambled as fast as they could for cover but it was too late. As soon as the tanker impacted the APC. The resulting force ruptured the tank and all it took was a single spark from the chaos to ignite the petroleum spilling from the tank. The explosion enveloped the sergeants and the sabers near it in a plume of searing flames, blanketing most of the area in a sea of fire. Dozens of sabers and the sergeants who were caught in the blast radius were killed instantly. But they were the lucky ones. The petroleum sprayed out in all directions, dousing the mercenaries with the sticky substance and lighting them aflame. It adhered to their skin and burned through their suits as they desperately tried to get the makeshift napalm off of them but to no avail. All they did was tear off their melting skin when they pulled off their uniforms. The fire began to spread all around the area as the sabers scrambled to get away from the searing flames, hoping that things couldn't get any worse. It did. He's on the bridge. Tango Primary's coming. A saber shouted as he pointed to the service bridge. Every saber within an earshot stopped what they were doing and rushed towards the entrance to the expo district, leaving behind their comrades who were dead, dying, or reduced to charred corpses. The makeshift barricades were swarming with sabers as they armed the mounted defenses, including M2 Browning turrets, GE M134 miniguns, and 19 Malawian Quatches grenade launchers. Snipers up on the buildings near the bridge took their position with their sniper rifles at the ready. Several APCs rolled up near the emplacements and rotated their 30mm guns at the bridge. Everyone else armed their weapons and prepared themselves. As the sounds of crackling fire and the moans of the dying filled the air, the sabers never took their eyes off the bridge but their shaking arms were clear signs they were now completely demoralized. After several nerve-shredding seconds, he finally came into view. The slayer slowly walked across the bridge towards the entrenched sabers with all of the blood that was caked onto his armor mysteriously gone. 
One of the sabers buckled from the pressure and fired his assault rifle at the Doomslayer, causing everyone else to open fire. A cascade of lead and grenades streaked across the bridge, hitting the Slayer dead on, but the shots went straight through him. It was like they were shooting at a phantom, everything was hitting nothing but air as the Tango primary kept walking towards them without a scratch. He got closer and closer to the sabers as the bullets went through his body and suddenly disappeared in a bright flash. The sabers stopped firing and jerked backward in confusion, spotting a small object sitting on the ground where the hostile just vanished. It was white-colored and resembled a grenade with blue lights on the side. Sparks started to shoot out from it and the device dissolved into rusted metal. As the sabers tried to process what was going on, they were alerted to a scream coming from above. They all looked up to one of the nearby buildings and saw to their horror the Tango primary disemboweling one of the sniper teams with a chainsaw. The Slayer stared down at the terrified sabers as they fired upon him again. Before his foray into the Expo district, the Slayer threw the petroleum tanker at them to disorient them and then deployed his hologram projector as a distraction. He then swam over to the right quadrant of Eye Island as the hologram walked across the bridge, having arrived at the Expo district just as the sabers spotted his hologram. From there he easily clambered up to the nearest building without being spotted and killed the snipers on the roof. Drawing his super shotgun, the Doomslayer jumped off the roof with his saw and sawed off in his hands down towards the sabers who were now screaming bloody murder. Eye Island Central Tower Ballroom Momo's heart slammed against her chest as she watched the vigilante tearing through the sabers on the main screen. Tears were streaming down her cheeks as she hyperventilated out of fear. Her friends weren't faring much better. Ida and Denki were having panic attacks, Mineta had fainted and poor Jiro was now openly sobbing into Momo's shoulder. The partygoers and captured heroes were having the same reaction. Every scene played out the same, scores of mercenaries would try to fight the armored man only for them to be horribly butchered like animals. Blood and entrails flew everywhere, it was like watching a horror movie come to life. All Might felt his blood run cold as he watched the man tear out a saber's spine with his bare hands. Never in his entire life did he ever witness so much blood and savagery. He was no stranger to the grim realities of being a hero, from watching his mentor Nana die before his eyes to his bloody duel with all for one that left him crippled, he knew the risks that came with the job. But this was something completely different. This was a man who had absolutely no qualms about killing and didn't have a shred of mercy within him. Not only that, but it was the same man who disarmed Tamira Shigaraki not just a day ago. All Might was so transfixed on the vigilante's rampage that he couldn't even begin to question what he was doing here during a siege. All he kept seeing were the terrorists being torn apart in the most horrific way possible. Nothing could stop him. Every bullet bounced off of whatever armor he was wearing and he ripped apart armored vehicles with ease. He wielded weapons that shredded through scores of mercenaries. He would never forget how he tore off the head of one of them and crushed it in his hand in front of the camera as a message to Nine. It was barbarism at its worst. He had to stop this mindless slaughter but he was still tied up by the security system and he could still feel one for all bleeding away. Nine and his lieutenants couldn't believe this was happening. His army of 9,870 highly trained hero killers was being decimated by one man. One man. He snuck past his tightly defended perimeter, destroyed his personal sub as well as half of their forces and now he was reducing his men into piles of limbs. That man was out for him. He knew that all too well when he crushed the skull of one of his soldiers while glaring at him through the camera. You fuck you P.S. He heard Wolfram growl. Nine glared icily at the villain. Would you care to repeat that? You bunch of fuck you P.S. Wolfram raged. I thought you were the best mercs in the world. How did this fucking lunatic slip past you? That's what we want to know. Whoever he is, he managed to circumvent our security system and turned it against us. Mummy defended. But the question is how did he do it? Sword Kill barked. This place is supposed to be on par with Tartarus Prison. I'm not sure of that myself. Nine began as he turned his gaze over to David, Melissa, and Sam. But I do have a hunch. Bring them over here. He ordered Slice and Chimera. The two marched over to them and the wolfman socked shields across the face before tossing him at Nine's feet. Chimera then grabbed Melissa by her hair and dragged her over to her father while Slice pulled out a stair TMP from her holster and pointed it at Sam who hastily got up. 
Nine grabbed David by the throat and hoisted him up so they could be at eye level. We're going to have a little chat, Mr. Shields. Nine said threateningly as he held up his hand which was now crackling with electricity. He shoved him over to Mummy who wrapped up David's arms with his bandages. Take him and the others to the server room. He ordered his lieutenants as they dragged them out of the ballroom. He then regarded his soldiers. All of you take the elevator down to the main lobby and coordinate with our remaining forces to hunker down and defend the main tower. Have our entire tank division along with a contingent of our men advance on the lower quadrant so we can take back the airport and secure the hostages. Understood, sir. The sabers nodded. But all of the elevators are out due to the EMP dash. A bolt of lightning shot out of Nine's hand and collided with the saber, killing him instantly while sending him flying into the far wall. Then take the goddamn stairs. Nine shouted as the remaining sabers ran out of the room. Looking at the steaming corpse of the soldier Nine just killed, Wolfram motioned sword kill, Daigo, and Nobu to follow the saber lieutenants to the server room. He went over to his goons. You all stay here and keep this room on lockdown. If any of these pricks try anything funny, plug em. The hired guns nodded and spread out around the ballroom while Wolfram left the room. Nine narrowed his eyes after he left and decided to head for the server room as well. Before he exited the room, he took one last glance at the screen showing his enemy pulling out a handheld railgun to vaporize the sniper teams on the rooftops. Why didn't he hear about this man a long time ago? Whatever his price was, it would have been worth it. Hero Public Safety Commission Headquarters Crisis Room The HPSC president had her arms folded as she breathed through her nose. Sayaka Grant was an American-slash-Japanese woman in the late 50s with steely blue eyes and slicked blackish blonde hair. She wore a black suit with a blue dress underneath and maintained an air of professionalism. But that was starting to crack as beads of sweat formed on her head and her arms were shaking. Standing in a small private room, Sayaka looked out the room-length glass window at the rows of agents and tech analysts working at their consoles within a massive room. Or at least they would have if they weren't glued to the main screen in abject horror. Sayaka looked to the giant screen spanning the length of the room and felt her throat tighten. She mentally recapped how this entire situation came to this ghastly outcome. The Steel Sabres had seized Eye Island and captured the symbol of peace along with pro-heroes from different countries as well as the island's scientists and tourists. The HPSC was able to coordinate a perimeter alongside the JSDF and the Japanese government. They were in the middle of planning a method of infiltrating Eye Island without the Sabres noticing while also brainstorming on how the mercenaries were able to easily infiltrate the seafaring facility. When they concluded that it had to have been an inside job, they just got word that a random man wearing armor charged through the perimeter and put five pro-heroes in the hospital. Not only did they find out that he managed to escape, but it was the same vigilante who tore off the arm of the LOV leader. This had put everyone in the crisis room in a frenzy as they tried to make sense of what was happening until the Sabres hijacked the airwave across half the mainland of Japan to broadcast their demands. But when he appeared on screen, there were no words to describe what happened next. After the bloodbath, they had no time to catch their breaths when an explosion on the scale of a small atomic bomb destroyed half the entire island. Sayaka immediately ordered her technicians to activate their top-secret surveillance satellite so they could see what was happening on the island. They now had a bird-eye view of Eye Island and when they zoomed in, all they could see were the streets running red with blood. The vigilante was on a murderous rampage against the sabers, shredding through them like they were paper. He didn't stop at all, he just kept killing and killing without pause. Several people had to leave the room or threw up all over their desks. Sitting herself down in her seat near the conference table, Sayaka buried her face in her hands as she heard the sounds of the sabers screaming as they were torn apart by the madman. Sitting not far from her wearing the same expression of horror was her top agent, Mara Yukumaru. Mara was a middle-aged man with messy beige hair and wore a formal black suit as per the HPSC dress code. His most discerning feature was the heavy bags under his eyes due to lack of sleep from overworking. Despite that, he was a well-regarded and proficient agent in the organization, being in charge of reviewing the performances of heroes and scoping out potential candidates for becoming pros. Not only that but he had a sizable military career, spearheading multiple countervillainy operations ending with a 100% success rate. His once sleepy eyes were fully awake and bugging out of his head as he watched the vigilante grab a saber by the leg and use him as a human club against the other mercs. 
Lips quivering, Mara glanced back to his laptop which was scanning for any radioactive contamination since the detonation of the Sabre's nuclear submarine. Completely clean. Not a single shred of radioactivity for miles. He should feel relieved but what was driving him nuts was how. Looking over to Sayaka, Mara closed his laptop and walked over to her. He sighed, scratching the back of his head as he looked back at the monitor showing the one-sided shit show. Listen, it's a little risky, but I can get boots on the ground dash. We can't do anything until our government lifts the no-fly order. Sayaka interrupted, looking up at him. Mara couldn't believe what he was hearing. He let out a laugh of frustration. Oh. Great. That's just perfect. Well while we're sitting here twiddling our thumbs, Arnold Leatherface Schwarzenegger is turning I Island into the set of a Quentin Tarantino movie. You think I don't want to end this insanity as much as you do? Sayaka snapped. For all we know, we could end up putting more innocent lives at risk if we start sending soldiers and heroes over there. The public dash. Oh, right. The public. We certainly can't forget that they'll have fucking night terrors for the next 15 years after what they all saw on TV. Mara threw up his hands. Sayaka was about to reprimand him for his language when the phone on her desk began to ring with the voice of her receptionist coming through the speakerphone. Ma'am. The Prime Minister is on line one. It's urgent. Sayaka's eyes widened. Mara almost lost his balance. The Prime Minister of Japan was calling them. Oh shit. Mara mumbled. You better have all your eggs in one basket for this one. Zip it. Sayaka pointed at him, shutting him up. Taking a deep breath and composing herself, the president of the HPSC picked up the receiver and answered. Hello yes, I understand the severity of the situation. No, we don't know the identity of the vigilante but we can confirm that he is fighting the steel sabers. We're unable to ascertain the safety of All Might and the hostages but they will be our top priority to rescue. You have. I understand, I'll notify the authorities. Thank you, Prime Minister. She set the receiver down and faced Mara. He's just rescinded the lockdown and permitted us to coordinate with the JSDF and pro heroes on a mission to retake the island. Let's get to work. Mara smiled broadly. Best news I've heard all day. The two of them went out the door leading to the main room with all present agents. Mara clapped his hands together to get everyone's attention. Okay, listen up, people. We dash. Suddenly, all of the computers in the room as well as the main monitor went completely black and nearly plunged the room into total darkness. They came back on after a few seconds but this time, every screen showed a white background with a blue colored symbol. It was a circle in the middle with three odd shapes around it. Before Sayaka could demand what was going on, the phone began to ring from inside the private room. A jingle was then heard through the ceiling speakers and a message came up underneath the symbol on the monitors. Answer the phone. Sayaka and Mara numbly glanced at each other in shocked confusion before slowly heading back to the private rooms with all eyes on them. Some of the agents started to follow them. Now in the room, Sayaka cautiously reached for the ringing phone as Mara sweated nervously. The two nearly jumped out of their skins when a computerized voice spoke through the speakerphone. Slash hello. I have blocked off all communication access to the JSDF and authorities throughout your headquarters and other government institutions. For your safety, as well as the safety of the hostages, do not interfere with our operations, forward slash. W. Watt. Sayaka breathed before she instantly became serious. Who is this? She demanded. Slash who I am is not relevant. But you have our assurance that the hostages and All Might will be rescued and the Steel Sabres will plague Hero Society no more. Thank you for your time, forward slash. The line went dead and they were left absolutely stunned. Mara looked like his brain had just melted while Sayaka had to sit herself down. Pulling her handkerchief out of her pocket and wiping the sweat off her brow, the president of the HPSC now felt like the smallest person in the world. To be continued. Chapter 14. The Destroyer. Part 3. A swirling void of pure darkness was the first thing Midoriya could see when his eyes fluttered open. He tried moving his fingers but he couldn't. Looking down at himself, he jolted in shock when he witnessed the black substance snaking around his entire body. 
Even his mouth was covered in it. Midoriya struggled as hard as he could to free himself from his bindings but it was like he was submerged in cement. Fearing that this was the afterlife, Midoriya resigned himself to his fate until he noticed something that gave him pause. Up ahead were multiple silhouettes engulfed in shadow, staring at him with glowing yellow eyes. One of the figures began to march towards him. Oi, oi, oi. What the hell do you think you're doing, kid? As the apparition got closer, the darkness encompassing him began to dissipate, revealing a lanky, heavily muscled form of a man wearing leather pants, a biker jacket, shoulder pads, and an ammo belt draped across his chest. Only the figure's face was still obscured by shadow. It ain't over till it's over. So stop sitting around on your ass and get back in the fight. I Island Central Tower Third Floor Izuka's eyes shot open as a loud gasp escaped his throat. He was staring up at the ruined, partially caved-in ceiling of the employee rec room. He groaned as he picked himself off the ground while moving away the pieces of the ceiling on top of him. Standing on wobbly legs, Izuka looked around the partially darkened, dust-shrouded room with the only light being the moon shining through the broken window. He frantically searched for his friends who were most likely somewhere under the debris when an overhead light hanging by its wires shorted out and spat out sparks, briefly illuminating the room enough for Midoriya to spot the prone form of Yuraka lying on the ground. Gasping, he rushed to her side and gently lifted her up a little, being as careful as he could. Yuraka. Yuraka, are you okay? Speak to me. No answer. She was unmoving. Setting her back down again, Izuka's mind was racing as he tried to think of what he could do. He suddenly thought back to CPR class with recovery girl back at UA. And though the thought of mouth to mouth caused his face to turn red, he knew the gravity of the situation and steeled himself. Placing his hands on the center of her chest, Midoriya began compressing Uraraka's chest at a steady pace, stopping once to give her mouth to mouth resuscitation. After a few more compressions, Ochako began to cough and slowly opened her eyes. The first thing that came into her vision was Izuku, relieved that she regained consciousness. D.E.K.U. Yuraraka shouted, overjoyed as she shot up and wrapped her arms around Midoriya in a tight hug. I'm so happy you're okay. Izuku was as red as a tomato. Yeah, so am I. He patted her back and made a mental note not to mention anything about the brief, indirect kiss. The sound of someone groaning caught their attention and they looked to the right to see Shoto and Mirio slowly getting up and covered in dust. Guys. Mirio was elated to see the others safe and sound. Are you hurt anywhere? We're fine. Izuka nodded. What about you guys? We felt worse. Shoto responded, shaking his head a little to dispel the dizziness. What about Kirishima and Bakugu? Yuraraka asked out of concern as Mirio and Shoto began to look around. The sound of clattering was heard in the back and everyone witnessed Kirishima using his hardening quirk to rip away the debris on the ground. Guys, get over here. Bakugu's hurt real bad. He shouted as he frantically threw away the broken pieces of the ceiling from his friend. Everyone immediately began helping Kirishima until they finally found an unconscious Bakugu with blood covering his face and barely breathing. Kaken. Izuku exclaimed. Get him on the couch. Quick. Shoto hurriedly advised as Mirio and Kirishima quickly picked him up and carried him over to the furniture. Yuraraka grabbed the first aid kit hanging on the wall while Izuku grabbed a bottle of water and a towel by the sink. Once Bakugu was on the couch, Izuku poured water on the towel and wiped away the blood while Yuraraka got out the bandages and a bottle of antiseptic. Mirio took a closer look at Bakugu, trying to find where the wound was. Good news. It's not as bad as it looks. An elated Mirio announced when he found the wound amongst the tufts of Katsuki's spiky hair. It's just a tiny cut, I should be able to patch it up in no time flat. But wasn't he covered in blood? Yuraraka questioned as she handed Mirio the bandages and antiseptic. Minor cuts on the head bleed heavily because there are lots of blood vessels around the face and scalp that are very close to the skin. So while it did look bad, it's just a small scrape. Mirio lectured as he dabbed some antiseptic onto the wound. Bakugu winced a little as Mirio began to wrap the bandages around his head. He'll be fine but he's going to be out of it for a while. Kirishima leaned in close next to Izuku. You just know he's gonna be pissed when he wakes up. He whispered. 
Izuka sighed in resignation. Hey, do you all hear that? Shoto said, looking around. Everyone stayed silent and listened closely. Their ears began to pick up the unmistakable sounds of gunfire and explosions. Moving towards the shattered window, the others went over to look outside while Mirio tended to Bakugu. From far away over in the Expo district, they could see columns of smoke and fire along with tracer fire streaking into the midnight sky. Their jaws agape, their bewilderment soon turned to fear when they heard the sounds of screaming amongst the mercenaries. Then, it all came back to them. The horror they saw unfold before their eyes on television. It was him. Guys, dot. Kirishima stammered as he looked down at the streets below. They all followed his gaze and saw a literal river of blood flowing through the streets with the sabers in various states of bodily dismemberment floating in the proverbial river sticks. They all reeled back inside. Midoriya was instantly on his knees, dry heaving as sweat poured down his head. Kirishima staggered backward, clutching the sides of his head and muttering panic denials. Shoto slumped against the wall, utterly terrified beyond comprehension for the first time in his life. Uraraka was taking it the worst. She was on her hands and knees, profusely vomiting with tears running down her round cheeks. What's wrong? What's going on out there? Mirio asked out of concern and he went over to the window and leaned his head out. No. Shoto quickly yelled. No don't dash. Mirio gasped in horror and stumbled back into the room with an expression of terror written all over his face. He clamped his hands over his mouth as his legs wobbled uncontrollably. Izuka stopped dry heaving and clutched his chest, feeling his own beating heart against his chest. His eyes found their way over to Uraraka who was now shaking as her fingers dug into the carpet. Ochako. Izuka worriedly placed a hand on her shoulder. Uraraka let a small gasp as she spun her head around to Izuku. Their eyes locked on each other as Midoriya saw just how scared she was. Uraraka's face scrunched up and she suddenly latched onto Izuku, squeezing him as tight as she could as he buried her face into his chest while softly weeping. Midoriya was taken aback by this. Not because he was flustered that a girl was hugging him, it was because he realized just how bad her trauma was. I Island Expo District, nine hours earlier. Post-traumatic stress disorder. It's really that bad. Izuku gulped nervously. We think so. Ever since she saw that vigilante rip off Tamira's arm, she's been jumping at shadows left and right. She barely looks at us or even speaks to us. Momo explained, feeling terrible for Ochako. But for some reason, she seems to lighten up a little around you so maybe you should try and talk to her. Inao, try to comfort her and let her know we're there for her. Jiro suggested. Well, air, I mean dash. Come on, Izuku. She needs this. I Island Central Tower present time. Izuku slowly began to bring up his hands and gently held Uraraka. He knew that this wasn't the best time to try and talk to her as he too had the same feeling of terror she was experiencing. All he could do was let her know that she wasn't alone. As he hugged her back, the sounds of warfare still echoed in the distance and Midoriya prayed that this nightmare would soon be over. I Island Expo District. Sonic Mayhem Quad Machine. No Temra Mal Alguno, no Temra Mal Alguno, no Temra Mal Alguno. Heedless of the saber's terrified babbling, the Doomslayer grabbed him by the scruff of his uniform and hoisted him off the ground. Slash I have tapped into the Central Tower's communications room and have blocked off any attempts for the government and pro-heroes to attempt to intervene. No one will impede you, forward slash. Fantastic. Aeaweawa. Help me. Hell dash. And he then slammed the merc into the pavement, his fist bursting apart his lungs and causing blood to erupt from his mouth like a geyser. The slayer stood himself up and watched the army of sabers flee for their lives away from him. Behind him was a scene of carnage and fire, piles of dead sabers and destroyed APCs littered the scenic gardens of the Expo District, many of the lush flowers were either set ablaze or smeared with blood. Displays that showcased brand new inventions or support items were reduced to twisted heaps of metal from the Slayer's weapons. Speaking of weapons, the Doomslayer noticed the ammo counter on his HUD showing that he had halved most of his reserves. Guess he got a little too overzealous with his slaughter of the steel sabers. He didn't think he would end up chewing through his ammunition this quick in such a short time. 
but this minor inconvenience only gave him an idea, he could use the Sabre's own weaponry against them. Spotting two GEM-134 miniguns near a destroyed ammo depot the Sabre set up, the Slayer picked them up and wielded them both in his hands. Eyeing the retreating mercenaries, the Slayer bolted forward as the ammo belts for the miniguns trailed behind him. He easily hefted up both weapons and unleashed hell upon the sabers. The minigun carved through them like a sickle, not a single merc was spared as they continued to retreat, many of them dropping their weapons as they fled the hopeless battle. But the slayer was fresh out of mercy as he pursued them with both guns blazing. He gunned down any saber that was caught in his sight and made sure none of them escaped his wrath. To his amusement, several of them stopped running to fire back in some futile act of defiance. But it was all for naught as the Doomslayer charged through their ranks in a relentless barrage of gunfire that tore them to ribbons. The minigun soon ran dry and he chucked one away while he clubbed the other one against a saber's skull before discarding it. Entering the dining pavilion, the Slayer spotted a discarded M2 Browning HMG near another barricade. A saber was already manning the weapon but before he could fire, the Slayer grabbed him by the face and tore it off along with his gas mask. The saber screeched as he grabbed his bleeding visage until the slayer headbutt him, popping the skull like a zit. Hefting up the HMG, the slayer gripped the barrel while his other hand clutched the spade grip where the trigger was. Turning towards a group of sabers attempting to attack him, the slayer blasted them apart, 50 caliber ammunition tore through their bulletproof vests like wet paper. He resumed his chase of the retreating sabers as he swept the HMG left and right at any merc unlucky enough to be within his field of view. The armor-piercing rounds penetrated through their ranks as the M2 Browning roared its ammunition from its glowing hot barrel. Many mercenaries hid behind whatever cover they could find but the rounds obliterated them so hard that their bodies became human salsa. His HUD showed the remaining sabers had retreated into a large building that housed some of the most recently unveiled support items. He ran towards the building ahead just in time to see an APC parked in front of the entrance with its turret aimed right at him. The Slayer never gave the gunner time to fire as he unloaded the rest of the HMG into the vehicle, the piercing ammo easily shredding through it and killing the occupants inside. Once the last of its ammunition had been expended, the Doomslayer hurled the HMG like a javelin at the sabers behind the sandbags and succeeded in impaling two of them in a row. Hopping up onto the ruined APC, the Slayer ripped off its still-functioning 30mm turret and grabbed the wires running into it. Giving it a tight tug, a 30mm round exploded out of the barrel and tore straight through several retreating sabers and drilling through the steel columns and walls of the building. He walked through the luminescent blue halls of the hero item building blasting away the sabers as they returned fire upon him. His quick, short tugs of the wires sent salvos of death at the mercenaries who were blown apart, painting the walls and floor with their body parts. The rounds that hit the numerous support items caused explosions to ripple throughout the building, killing any saber caught in the blast radius and setting fire to the displays. In the eyes of the sabers, the Doomslayer was the personification of the Grim Reaper and the handheld cannon was his scythe. The sounds of heavy, mechanical footsteps echoed through the halls and a huge shape crashed through the wall next to the Slayer. He whirled around and fired the 30mm cannon but was backhanded halfway across the room and smashed into a display case containing a red-colored surveillance drone. Quickly picking himself back up, the Slayer was treated with the sight of two bulky mechs, each of them roughly the size of an elephant. They had a yellow and black color scheme with ocular sensors installed on the shoulders where their heads would be. Their bodies were large and dome-like, standing atop powerful hind legs while their arms had been replaced with construction equipment. The first mech had a wrecking ball and a giant jackhammer while the second one was equipped with a chain trencher and a rock wheel. The Slayer raised an eyebrow. It was almost like he was facing mechanical versions of the Hell Guards. See. I told you we'd get these stupid things working. A voice blared from the speakers mounted on the first mech. Whatever. This is where it ends, you freak. They're gonna scrape what's left of you into a shoebox. The second mech boasted as it saws thrum to life. A group of sabers who were hiding behind a toppled column began cheering. But their revelry was cut short when the Doomslayer unloaded the rest of the 30mm cannon's ammo into the group and turned them into gibbs. The Slayer tossed away the cannon and cracked his knuckles. Slash my scans indicate they have repurposed these exosuits for combative purposes. Their original function was to primarily assist in construction, they were created under the request of the pro hero Power Loader for use in his agency and company, Power Loader Construction, forward slash. 
The slayer cared not for the info as he charged at the mechs who lumbered towards him. The first mech swung its wrecking ball at the doomslayer who easily caught it and flung it along with the mech right over his shoulder like it weighed absolutely nothing. As the first mech collided into the wall, the second mech swung its rock wheel at the slayer in an attempt to cut him in half. The slayer punched the saw into pieces with one blow, followed up by slamming his foot into the mech's right leg and destroying the servo motors. The mech fell to one knee and the slayer easily tore the chain trencher right off of its arm and swung it down onto the dome, easily carving through it and instantly killing the saber piloting it. The second mech got back up and swung its wrecking ball at him again but one punch from the slayer shattered it like it was made of glass. In a last-ditch attempt, the mech thrust its jackhammer at the slayer but he instantly caught it and wrenched it off of its arm. He smashed the jackhammer against the mech's body and then ran it through with its own weapon, the still hammering tool puncturing into the cockpit and mulching the pilot. As the exosuit slumped over with the jackhammer still impaled through it, the slayer's shoulders sagged a little in disappointment. Well, that was pathetically easy. The hell guards were way tougher than these cheap knockoffs. His HUD pinpointed the last two remaining sabers left in the expo district were not far from his position. In fact, they were already in the building. The two sabers, Marley and Cruz, ran down the small hallway towards the emergency exit. They tried to open the door but it was locked, much to their confusion. Why the fuck isn't it opening? Marley yelled in frustration. I don't know. Cruz panicked as he banged on the keypad on the side of the door. Something's forcing the electronic lock to dash. Cruz's head suddenly exploded, showering Marley with blood and pieces of gray matter. The headless body slumped against the door and Marley shakily looked down the hallway to see Tango Primary slowly walking towards him with a smoking double barrel in his hands. Marley raised his MG4 at the Slayer but could not find the will to pull the trigger. The Doom Slayer continued to inch closer and closer until Marley finally gave up and threw away the gun. Wait. Don't fucking shoot me. He shouted as he raised his hands into the air. I give up. See. I surrender. Unfortunately for Marley, this had the exact opposite effect, it made the Slayer angrier. He reloaded his super shotgun while matching up to the Merc with murderous intent. The Saber fell to his knees with his arms still raised as the Doomslayer pushed the barrel of his weapon up against his forehead. No 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 no. What the fuck? I don't want to fight anymore. I give up. Marley screamed as he felt the still hot barrels of the sawed off burn his forehead. The Slayer felt his anger increasing with each pitiful plea that came from the Merc's mouth. After everything this organization had done to heroes worldwide, one of them wanted to surrender. How many heroes were gunned down without mercy? How many families did they ruin? How many young heroes had their lives cut way too short because of them? How many heroes begged for their life only to be put down like they were some kind of rare game? The Steel Sabers did not deserve mercy. None of them did. Come on, man. Just let me go and I promise I'll turn over a new leaf please dash. The deafening sound of buckshot filled the hallway as Marley's head was reduced to red mist and splattered what was left of his skull onto the walls when the Slayer fired his super shotgun point-blank into his face. Pushing over the dead body with his foot, the Slayer turned around and walked back to the atrium as his HUD showed the total number of sabers left on Eye Island. 1,156 remaining. Slash I have scanned the building and discovered several support items that were unaffected by the EMP. We could utilize some of them to our advantage in this universe, forward slash. Support items. The Slayer then snapped his fingers. He had completely forgotten his other objective while fighting the Sabres. Eye Island exterior. Beneath the lapping waves outside of the protective wall surrounding the island, a massive creature surged beneath the surface. At first, it looked like a gigantic sperm whale but this particular one had ape-like arms and legs. It dove deeper into the depths until it reached the metallic underbelly of Eye Island. Spotting a hole torn open on the underside from the explosion earlier, the whale charged through the opening and breached itself into the island. Popping its girthy head out of the water, the first thing it saw was a column of fire reaching up into the sky as it billowed forth from the ruined industrial district. Spotting a place where it could dispense its cargo in the central quadrant of Eye Island, the whale opened its gigantic maw and a sphere made out of ash floated out of its mouth. The sphere floated down to the street littered with craters and dissipated to reveal three villains working for the LOV and a Nomo. 
Maguma Iwata was a burly giant of a man wearing a dark blue bodysuit and a gas mask along with gauntlets, shoulder pads, and boots that resembled superheated stone. His hair was a fiery orange and steam could be seen coming out of the pores on his shoulder pads. His quirk allowed him to produce and control liquid magma with skillful and deadly ease. Known by his villain name Volcano, he was infamous for decimating Esoha City years ago and leading a band of robbers known as the Volcano Thieves. Now he and his cohorts worked for All for One, a job they embraced with pride. Kanako Heizono, also known as Dusty Ash, was a tall and voluptuous woman wearing highly revealing attire. It consisted of a black low-cut sports bra, back ankle boots, a utility belt with garters, black gloves, and light purple panties. Her white hair was wavy and done up in a ponytail, she wore a transparent eye mask along with a respirator around her neck and wielded a club in the shape of a ninjato that hung off her belt. Her quirk allowed her to produce volcanic ash from her body and shape it at will into a variety of uses. Tsumuji Kazetani was the strangest thing on two legs. Some naysayers would say that mutation-type quirks were a burden but as some heroes or villains would prove, never judge a book by its cover. His skin was orange-colored, his overall body shape was incredibly lanky, his face gave him the appearance of a duck while his elongated fingers resembled fan blades. He wore a black sleeveless unitard with a purple belt, turquoise sneakers with tiny fans attached to the back of them, and goggles to protect his eyes during combat he also wore a backpack that would unfold into a large office fan that would enhance his abilities. His quirk earned him the villain name Gust Boy which gave him the ability to rotate his fingers or wrists to produce powerful gusts of wind, even tornadoes. To better fit with his theme, Tsumuji had his bluish-gray hair done up in a ponytail while stylized to look like fan blades. And then of course there was the Nomu itself. It was a hunched-over creature with light green skin, shredded jeans, and eight limbs that were either absurdly muscular or horribly atrophied. His main arms were incredibly long and malnourished but the six arms growing out of his back were anything but. They were beefy and veiny but also came attached with weapons jutting out of them. Four of them were chainsaws, one was a drill while the last one was a simple claw hammer. Its grotesque head was encased in an armored, purple-colored helmet with red visors and it had a metallic gag in its mouth. Clutched in its main arms was a metallic, cylindrical device with boosters attached to the bottom and the sides. The whale creature began to climb onto the street, its size nearly dwarfing the buildings. Then it hunkered down and began to morph like clay into a human being. The transformation ended and the beast was now a man wearing a black dress suit and black pants, designer shoes, and a large fur coat that was colored white. His face was a mishmash between two different species, on his right side, his face was human with unkempt black hair and baggy, soulless eyes while his left half had a black texture akin to that of a whale, an enlarged eye that was askew, white hair and a noticeable underbite with razor-sharp teeth. Pressing a small button on the metallic collar he wore, it began to unfurl itself into a helmet-like attachment that covered the disfigured side of his face. It resembled an old diving helmet with metallic barnacles at the top of the dome. This man was curator, all for one's most dedicated, proficient, and fanatically loyal agent whose obedience to his master was on par with Kurogiri and Dr. Garaki. His quirk gave him the abilities of a sperm whale, even transforming into a massive, ape-like whale monster. Breathing in and exhaling, Curator surveyed the devastation before him. It was like a small war had been waged here if the smell of death and blood in the air was any indication. Looking to his left, he saw a pile of saber corpses with a lake of blood around them along with several APCs reduced to the burning wreckage. The volcano thieves were disturbed by the gruesome sight while the Nomu just stared in the other direction vacantly. Fuck me. Volcano swore under his breath. How the hell did we not see this guy coming? Dusty Ash folded her arms as she swallowed. First he tears off Tamira's arm, pulverizes several pros and now he's waging World War III. I'm not sure even a vigilante is capable of killing this many hired guns. Not to mention those are the steel sabers. Gustboy added. Best of the best my ass. I told Wolfram that some of our own would be more than capable of handling this. Yeah, but how were we supposed to know our vigilante would get here? Maybe you didn't consider that little tidbit, eh? Dusty Ash nudged him teasingly. Gust Boy looked away, pouting. Volcano walked up next to Curator. It's pretty quiet. Chances are he's either taking a break or he's already killed them all. What's our game plan? 
Curator remained silent as he looked down at the bisected remains of a saber. To single-handedly challenge the most infamous band of mercenaries in the world and cause them significant losses was a feat unheard of. In the span of a few short hours, this man had already garnered his master's attention far quicker than anyone and it wasn't hard to see why. All for one had replaced his plan to recruit that mentally unstable brat who won the sports festival in favor of possibly welcoming this man into the LOV. However, one could not forget how he dismembered Shigaraki and there was a chance that this man would refuse the offer. Curator shared all for one's dislike of vigilantes and knew a man this dangerous had to be eliminated but focused on the task at hand. The vigilante isn't our concern at the moment. Curator spoke, his voice taking on a metallic tone due to his helmet. For now we will focus on our objective. Chainsaw. The package. The Nomo lurched forward and set the device on the ground. It opened up automatically to reveal four tubes containing multiple orbs filled with a yellow liquid and attached via a set of strings. Around the tubes was an array of wires and clockwork-based mechanisms. Dusty Ash and Gustboy knelt down to get a closer look. Gustboy whistled. Didn't think the boss would break this thing out so soon. A weapon like this is pretty hard to come by these days. Consider it the definition of Pyrrhic victory. If our plans do fail here, we will demoralize society when they watch the people and heroes they were supposed to save die a slow, slow death. Curator explained with a hint of sadistic glee. And if All Might survives? Volcano questioned. It will be of no consequence. We will deal with him at another time when the opportunity presents itself. Curator waved his hand as he turned to Kanako. Dusty Ash, take us to the roof. You and Gustboy will arm the package while Volcano, Chainsaw, and I will meet with Wolfram. I want to see how he'll explain himself this time. Dusty Ash summoned a large cloud of ash from her skin and formed a massive disc in the center of the street. Everyone stepped onto the platform with Gustboy carrying the package. Dusty Ash smiled slyly as she snapped her fingers. Elevator up. The disc floated upwards and began to fly itself to the roof with its passengers in tow. Volcano glanced over his shoulder to look at Chainsaw who was breathing heavily with saliva dripping from its gagged mouth. Gust Boy and Dusty Ash, grossed out by this display, took several steps away from it. Volcano rolled his eyes and looked up at the approaching Tower of Eye Island. Did we really have to bring a middle-tier Nomo with us? I feel like we would have been better off with Kurogiri or one of the high ends the doctor is futzing with. He voiced his opinion to Curator. We have six complete candidates but Garaki is still applying the finishing touches. Kurogiri is currently undergoing a mission but Chainsaw will be more than capable of assisting us. Curator assured him with confidence. Volcano looked to his left and took in the sight of a river of blood flowing through the streets with thousands of dead sabers bobbing along the surface. I doubt it. He thought to himself grimly. I Island Expo District several minutes earlier. Sonic Mayhem crashed up again. The Slayer walked through the decimated halls of the Hero Item building until he kicked open the doors leading to another pavilion which was somewhat undamaged from the 30mm rounds. Slash some of the support items in this exhibition were made with Moometal. It is an insulated ferromagnetic alloy with high resistance to electricity, they were protected by the EMP. The main vault in I Island's central tower contains far more advanced support items but I have located two inventions within this exhibition that will be useful to us. Marking them on your HUD now, forward slash. The Doomslayer walked past the displays until he come upon the first item on his list in its case. It was a black cuboid with transparent windows on the sides, a slot in the front, and several buttons located at the top. Slash this support item is known as an energy replicator. It is a recently made invention created to harness the power of energy type quirk users and convert it into clean energy based on the quirk's abilities. With the right alterations, we may be able to convert it into a fabricator for argent-free plasma energy, forward slash. Now that was useful and no argent energy was a big plus. He didn't want this world harnessing that energy after everything that happened on the alternate Mars. He plucked the support item from its display case and pocketed it into his hammer space backpack. Moving on, he walked through the room a little bit more until he came to another display case that held his second item. It was a red-colored disc with four metallic pads on the front with a touch-screen display on the sides. Slash this item was based on a cloning quirk belonging to a Canadian pro-hero. 
While it is still in its prototype phase, it can clone inorganic material or objects at the molecular and atomic levels. Adjustments to this device will enhance its capabilities, it could easily create more ammunition for your weapons including UAC-based munitions forward slash. Again, another nifty little toy that would be a huge help. Looks like he wouldn't have to worry about running out of ammo once Vega was done with the tune-ups. Snagging another invention and dispensing it into his backpack, the Slayer began to head towards the exit until Vega chimed in with an update. Slash Slayer, five villains have just arrived on the island. I can confirm that they are with the League of Villains, forward slash. His HUD showed camera footage of the crooks Vega was talking about. He memorized their appearances as Vega brought up info on them by accessing the criminal database from the HPSC computers. Three of them were thieves who disappeared a few years ago while there was no info on the green creature. What kind of fucked up quirk did that one have? However, the information on the man with the fur coat caught his interest and malice. Isana Ushimitsudoki was born into a wealthy family but was passed over by his far more successful brother. When he reached his teens, he murdered his parents and brother in a staged traffic accident so he could claim their fortune. After several years, private investigators discovered the truth behind the plot, and Isana was arrested but not before killing several officers and a pro hero with his quirk. He was en route to a highly secure prison for dangerous villains but the prison van that was transporting him never arrived and was found destroyed with Isana missing and his police escort dead. He was never seen again but it was clear to the Slayer that the LOV most likely busted him out and he had now joined up with them. The Slayer made himself a reminder to make this guy's death slow. Slash I have acquired new details about the organization from their conversations. They are preparing a potential weapon of mass destruction to erase any evidence of their activities here and a person whom they call all for one is the true leader of the League of Villains. This has left me to conclude that Tamira Shigaraki is only a figurehead, forward slash. The Slayer folded his arms and tapped his finger against them in thought. So that's how it was. Pull the strings from the shadows but let some unlucky sap take all the heat. But that had to be the dumbest name for a supervillain he had ever heard of. Couldn't this all for one have picked out something more threatening? Besides that, the Slayer wondered what this WMD was. Whatever it was capable of, the Slayer knew it had to be destroyed and those LOV fuckers needed to die. He decided that he would head back to the central tower, kill the Sabres as well as Nine, then kill the LOV and dismantle whatever the package was. Slash update, the Sabres are mobilizing a tank division at the central quadrant. Nine has ordered them to rendezvous with the remaining squads at the lower quadrant near the airport. They are attempting to retake the hostages, forward slash. The Doomslayer clenched his teeth in anger. He knew that Nijire and Tamaki would stand no chance against those mercenaries and the hostages would be in danger again. Change of plans, kill the rest of the Steel Sabres, tear Nine and his lieutenants into pieces, then take out the LOV members and scrap the bomb but he needed a way to get there and quickly before the tanks came. Slash I have located a vehicle that will transport you to the lower quadrant. On your right, forward slash. The Slayer turned in the direction Vega was pointing him towards to spot a sizable blue aircraft with a sleek, arrow-like design and white-colored wings that resembled the fins of a fish. A jet engine was installed into the other end of the craft with smaller, transparent fins around it. Slash this reconnaissance craft is designed to function as both a jet and a miniature submersible. It is made of the same moo metal as the support items and it has a full tank of fuel. This will allow you to arrive at your destination quickly, forward slash. Good enough for him. The Slayer went up to the aircraft, popped open the hatch, and climbed inside. Vega easily accessed the system and the craft began its startup procedures. While this was happening, the Slayer heard something activating next to the ship and glanced to his right. It was another large construction mech only this one did not resemble the exosuits he fought earlier. It was far bigger, roughly the size of a three-story house, and had a gray and white color scheme. The body stood atop four curved legs that ended in massive multidirectional wheels while its arms consisted of massive, hydraulic grapple claws meant for demolition. Its head stuck out of the chest area and had a single green visor stretching along its length, giving the impression that it was meant to be remotely piloted. The visor glowed brightly and the mech came to life, busting out of its restraints with ease and wheeling itself next to the jet. Slash I have hacked this construction drone to assist you in the lower quadrant. 
I have concluded from our operations on this island that we are stronger together and I now seek to directly aid you in any way I can forward slash. The Slayer didn't think it was possible that Vega would be helping him like this. He really was growing out of his limitations as an AI and taking a more hands-on approach to a situation rather than just advising him back on Mars and doing some minor hacking. But he had zero problems with this and gave the mech a thumbs up. He wished he could see the look on Hayden's face if he ever saw his formerly obedient creation kicking ass. With the startup procedures complete, the Doomslayer took the center stick and guided the craft upwards while the mech rumbled out of the room. Outside of the building, the front entrance exploded into rubble when the mech charged through it just as the aircraft burst forth from the roof and into the sky. The jet flew to the lower quadrant while the mech sped out of the expo district and drove across the adjacent bridge that led to the lower quadrant. The Doomslayer had already arrived before Vega's mech and could already see a large mass of saber all gathered in the center of the quadrant with a few groups heading towards the airport. The Slayer maneuvered his craft to the airport entrance, made a sharp right, and flew right towards the group of approaching sabers. The Merc saw it coming and quickly retreated but it didn't help them when the Slayer hit the throttle and mowed straight through the group. The sabers were either sliced in half by the wings, impaled by the nose cone, or pulverized against the hull and windshield due to how fast it was going. The jet was now nearing the main group who were about to open fire at the craft until Vegas mech arrived, plowing through a small building and running over the mass of sabers. They were grinded underneath its treaded wheels or swatted aside like bowling pins by its hydraulic arms, the force of the blows breaking every bone in their bodies. Some of them were scooped up in its powerful claws and crushed like nectarines with their blood pouring into the streets. The jet barreled through more sabers until it collided with an APC and exploded in a ball of fire that engulfed several mercs in searing flames. The Slayer, who easily survived the explosion without a scratch, kicked open the hatch and witnessed the mech smashing the sabers into paste while the sabers unleashed their weapons upon the mech. Several sabers spotted the Doom Slayer and fired at him in terror but then he, in a rare moment of creativity, grabbed two large chunks of rubble and charged at the hapless criminals, pulping the skull of one and then knocking off the jaw of another before throwing himself into the crowd with the mech wreaking havoc. The Slayer smirked as he swung the repurposed handful of solid stone down upon a saber's face so hard it caved his entire head in. This was going to be a great warm-up for what he had in store for Nine and the League of Villains. To be continued.